This morning, I continue on the series, What Does the Bible Say? And we're speaking about financial anxiety this morning. I have summarized a series that we preached in March and April of 2019. Uh, the series is called Financial Wholeness. I'm going to put a link on this YouTube video. Uh, it's on our website. It's not on our church app, in our sermon archives. Uh, it's definitely worth a listen. It's a four-week uh, eight sermon series, and I've just summarized the two first sermons on the first day of the series because it so aptly answers this question, what does the Bible say about financial stress? Now, I'm sure no one here has ever had any financial stress, um, but this is a message for your neighbor, so you can tell them about uh, how to get out of the situation they might find themselves in. Uh, I intend to preach a message as short as possible uh, because I'm really trusting for more than a message here today. I'm trusting for a breakthrough. There are a couple prophetic words which we're going to release at the end, and we're going to pray for breakthrough in this area, and I am sincerely trusting for something to happen. In your lives, in anyone's life online, anyone listening to this, I am trusting for a supernatural breakthrough to happen. A couple years ago, yes, already, already, you, I know you want it, you want it for your neighbor. Um, uh, already, you know, in my life many years ago, my wife and I went to a finance course here at the church, and it was in a space where the interest rates had gone through the roof. We had overextended ourselves. We wanted to become property moguls. Uh, we were just property uh, owners. No, the bank owned the property. We were property squatters. And uh, interest rates went through the roof. The rental income couldn't cover what we needed to cover. We had always been so wise with our money. We really, really had been wise. We slept on the floor. We drove a car we bought for 6,000 rand, and we had already bought three flats because we had long-term plans, and everything went to up in smoke when the interest rates went through the roof and we just took out credit cards. It was money. It was everywhere. It was a mess, man. Everything we had built was about to be taken away. We came on a finance course. I can't remember a thing from the finance course. I can't remember it was good or bad, but I remember a prayer that was prayed over us that changed our lives forever. A single prayer broke this drive, this desire where we were just money, 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 money. I remember in that season of my life going to preach at a youth camp in Petra Tiff, this arrogant salesman rocking up with his brand new Ford Focus and with the pastor sitting there, I preached to those teenagers, I don't want to be a pastor because I love money too much. I preached it, man, and everything was... It was a mess. And this prayer was prayed over me and the spirit of mammon was broken in an instant. And I can't even remember the timeline, but it was just a few months later. Every bit of our credit card debt was paid for. Our car was paid for. We just had our house debt. We managed to hold on to everything. And it's not because we were chasing after money. It's because we were chasing after God. God. And I trust that a prayer like that would break that spirit of mammon, that spirit of stress, that focus in your life that focuses on lack and need and want and next level that perpetuates the stressful environment where it's always, I don't have enough, I need to attain, I need to compete, I need to compare. So I pray that that is going to change your life. Already start trusting for God to do that. I need to tell you that financial stress is not a money problem. No matter how much you have, in every season of your life, I've spoken to people with more money than I could ever dream of having. That stress, they lose their hair, they, 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 they can't sleep. They got more, they've got a million, hundred times more than I could dream of having. And they stress balls. I've spoken to people with nothing and they stress balls. Stress is not a money thing. It's a response to a situation thing. It's a faith thing. It's a theology thing. And I know maybe in your situation right now, you might be thinking, if I just had another 10,000 rand a month, I'd be fine. Yes, temporarily, you probably will financially. But stress-wise, if you're stressing right now, you'll stress in the next season as well. That 10,000 rand will be swallowed up so quickly, you won't have that much debt. You'll go on a bigger holiday next year. You'll think you can afford a bigger house next year. You'll think you can afford a bigger car. And next year, you're in the same boat. Just another 10, just another five, just another. Money is not the solution to your stress about money. God is the solution to your stress about money. 
A little bit of money could solve your money problem, not your stress problem. God wants to heal us from our incorrect understanding of how we relate with material possessions. The definition of stress is a state of mental or emotional strain or tension resulting from adverse or demanding circumstances. It's not the circumstances, it is our response to the circumstance. So what does the Bible say about stressing about money? Well, the Bible says, be anxious for nothing. Now, I'm a mathematician. Follow my sum here. The Bible says, be anxious for nothing. When it comes to money, I have nothing. So I can replace nothing with money. So the Bible says, be anxious for money. The end. It's funny how, I, literally, I see you shaking your head, you shaking your head. That makes no sense, Sean. How can, but every day we try to explain to ourselves it's okay to worry about money. We just don't do it as obvious as I just did it. Every day we explain, yeah, but it's just this season. It's just this, it's just this problem. The next one will be fine. We explain ourselves out of this all the time. And it's because we have a wrong relationship with the material things of this world. The material things of this world were never supposed to be our source. Your job was never supposed to be your provision. Your skill was never supposed to be your provision. God was always supposed to be our provision. Always, always, always. And so we live in a broken world. And it's not your fault it's the world we live in. We live in a broken world, and because of the broken world we live in, we have a broken understanding of how to relate to the things that God has given us. And so in this financial brokenness that we have, we need to look at these things differently. We need to look at God differently. We need to rebuild a proper relationship with the things that God has given us so that they can serve the kingdom instead of us serving them. So the first point I want to make is here. He has a background to the symptoms, background and symptoms of our financial brokenness. So if we consider the journey, we're going to come full circle back to the journey that God walked out with the Israelites right at the beginning of him perpetuating his church and his people here on earth. The Israelites have come out of captivity. They've been under a, a foreign god, a foreign king, a foreign uh, uh, suppressor for nearly 400 years. They've learned the systems of Egypt. When they left Egypt, they took as much stuff as they could carry. They took the gold. They took the earrings. They took everything they could. They grabbed because they never had. And they adopted the Egyptian system, this Baal-worshipping, idol-worshipping culture of worshipping the stuff. What did they take with them? You read the scripture. They took as much stuff as they could carry, and they left. And in that space, God needed to teach them how to relate properly to the stuff that he had given them in the world in his way, not the Egyptian way. You look at the movies of the Egyptian pharaohs. They're buried. What are they buried with? With stuff, with the gold and the biggest. It's all that mattered. And it's so glaringly obvious in those old uh, tombs, but we just don't get to have tombs as big as they did. If we did, we'd probably find we'd take the same stuff to the grave with us now today, if not worse. Because it's all about the stuff. And so God leads them for 40 years through this process of understanding that he's their provider. And how does he do it? He says to them, you will not work. You will not sow, you will not plant, I will give you your food. You can't store it, you can't invest it, I'll give you five bags of manna if you will increase it tenfold for me so that I don't have to pick up manna for the next year. You will pick it up every day and it will be because I said it will be there, that's it. And he goes through this process and even explains the process to them in Deuteronomy chapter 8 from verse 3, he says, and he humbled you and let you hunger. And he fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone. 
He brought them into the process that we would know that we would not live on physical, material things, but that we would live on His Word. It says, but every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. He goes on to say, your clothing did not wear out. What? He provided everything they needed for 40 years. And then he comes and he gives them a warning on the back of this lesson. A couple verses later, if you're still in Deuteronomy chapter 8, skip down to verse 17. And he says from verse 17 here, after walking this journey for them of providing, being their sole provider for 40 years, there was no hierarchy, there was no special space for the rich, really good manna collectors, really good quail eaters, none of that. They were all the same. They all relied on the word of God. And he comes and he says, beware. Beware, verse 17, lest you say in your heart, my power and the might of my hand have gotten me this wealth. For 40 years, he teaches them, I am your provider. And here comes the warning. Beware, on the back of 40 years of me teaching you, beware that you don't step out of this place and somehow the devil convinces you that you're in this position that you are because of you. And therein starts the broken world, the broken system that we live in, where it's about me and my stuff and how I got it. My power and the might of my hand have gotten me this wealth. You shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the power to get wealth, that he may confirm his covenant, which was the old covenant that he swore to your fathers. He goes on in that in verse 19, he says, if you forget the Lord your God and go after other gods and serve them and worship them, and today we still worship idols in finances. We worship our jobs. We worship our bosses at the detriment of our relationship with God and the things that matter most. We have got so many idols. Financial brokenness of which the greatest symptom is anxiety and stress over finances, is a condition of the heart. The first verse there, he says, beware lest you say in your heart. It's not a condition of your bank account, it's a condition of your heart, financial stress. Beware lest you say in your heart, The Bible says where your treasure is, there also your heart will be. And if your treasure is in your stuff, your heart will go there. If your treasure is in God, your heart will go there. The material world was never designed to replace our reliance on God. But fortunately, we look time and time again in the words that Paul brings, Jesus brings. It's a journey. It's a journey. And I trust that journey will start today with a prayer that breaks something over our lives. But you know, I've seen my kids, they want to share, and then they see actually they don't want to share, and they say you can have, and then you can't have. Yeah, you can have one of my balloons, and then their brother starts having too much fun with the balloon, they're like, I I want the balloon back. And so it's it's not about, okay, God, you can have everything, because every day we try and take it back. And it's about choosing in this journey of faith to say every day, God, it's yours, not mine. God, it's yours, not mine. God, lead me. We need to break this ungodly reliance upon our power to think that it's all me. We need to live a heart that is healed financially. Anxiety, Philippians 4 verse 6 says, do not be anxious about anything. Jokes aside, that doesn't mean you can be anxious about money. But in everything, by prayers, supplications, which is just asking God, and thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. It says, and the peace that passes all understanding will guard your heart. Peace is one of the opposites of stress. Financial stress is healed with the peace of God. Jesus' disciples were on this journey. They hadn't learned the lesson. If you have your Bibles with you, Matthew 6, verse 30, it will also appear on the screen. Matthew 6, verse 30. 
The disciples were anxious. They were stressing about finance and provision. And Jesus comes to them and he says this in verse 30. He says, but if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you? He says to his brothers there, O ye of little faith, therefore do not be anxious, saying, and how many of us have said these lines? What shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first the kingdom and all of God's righteousness, and all of these things will be added. They were on the journey. Their heart was not yet healed. And God was busy walking a road with them, just the same as he wants to walk a road with you. Mary and Joseph were in a, in, in a time of turmoil, man. She goes because there needs to be a census. She's nine months pregnant. This is the culmination of God's ultimate eternal plan for Jesus to come to the earth. They're, they're, they're Jewish folk in a space under Roman occupation. Uh, they're being, I mean, it's not a good space. It's dangerous. Can you imagine sending your little teenage daughter, nine months pregnant, on the back of a donkey off to this town to get counted? You don't know what's gonna happen to her. You've got to understand, in the world they lived in, the household was everything. They didn't have a, a hospital to go to. Everything medically was looked after in their home. And they release her from the safety of her home. Not, hey, you got medical aid, just go to the nearest hospital. I could, nothing. Off you go. In one of the worst times it could have happened, not one of the prophetic words over Jesus and his birth had to be altered because of the political situation in that country. Nothing. And in that space, God brought gifts from a foreign land that they didn't ask for, that they weren't expecting, that looked after Jesus and his family for the first couple years of his life. Because his economy is ultimate. His economy is final. And he's not subject to the political turmoil in the country, wars breaking out, uh, stock markets. He's not, that is not his economy and is not his system. That is the system that was designed to distract us. I'm not saying go live under a rock and ignore it and stay away, but don't let that system use you and confuse you and manipulate you away from God. So what is the road to healing? There is a road to healing from financial brokenness. First thing first, we need to see that we're broken. Revelations 3.17, Jesus, or God, writes to the church of Laodicea. And he says, for you say, I am rich. I have prospered and I need nothing. Not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. Jesus, open our eyes to see the real state of our lives, not wealth according to our bank accounts, the real state of our lives. And so step number one in receiving healing from financial brokenness, which results in stress, sell all we have. I'm going to explain this one. <laughs> sell all we have. We've all heard the scripture. I'm going to the scripture in Mark chapter 10. I'm going to read it now. And so often when we preach it, we say this man that Jesus told to sell everything he had clearly just had an issue with money. God, Jesus never said it to anyone else. He only said it to this man. And we're so quick to glance over it and explain, no, 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 I don't have an issue. I'm not, this guy was super rich. We explain it. But pause here for a moment. Pause here for a moment. Linger and ask yourself, ask God, God, is there some of this message that I need to take home? Is there something here that you need to tell me? Let's read that scripture. Mark chapter 10 from verse 17. And it goes like this. And he was setting out on his journey and a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. And he said to him, teacher, all of these I have kept from my youth. And Jesus looked at him, loved him and said to him, you lack one thing. Go sell all that you have, give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. 
Then come follow me. Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Jesus looked around and says to his disciples, how difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. That word that he uses there for have is the same word we use when we marry someone, when we say to have and to hold. It's a very strong, possessive word. It's not about being wealthy. It's about being married to your money. And so I want to ask you, before you try to dodge the bullet, he says, go sell everything you have and give to the poor. Okay, I'm poor. Sell everything you have and give to me. It's not about putting yourself on the other side of the spectrum. Global perspective, we're the richest 10% of the world sitting in this church right now. If you own more than one pair of shoes, if you own a TV in your extended family, you're part of the richest 10% of the world. We're not poor, money-wise. We've just set standards that sometimes we struggle to meet. So before you try to dodge this bullet, ask yourself this question. On what grounds can I comfortably say Jesus would not say this to me? On what grounds can I say my possessions don't own me? We need to detach ourselves from ownership of the stuff we have. And it's hard, I know, but if you look at the biblical example set, it's all over scripture. Elijah calls Elisha, he's busy plowing his field. Elijah calls him. He goes and he burns his stuff. He kills his oxen. He has a massive briar and he leaves. Jesus calls his disciples. They're all in business. They leave their stuff right there. They leave their fishing. They leave their nets. They leave their financial support. They leave it instantly and they walk. The early church, it says no one had need because everyone sold their stuff and gave to everyone everyone that had need. If you look at the legacy of this church, Roland and Patty Barnard, living in Unkomas, they're in Derb, somewhere over there, decided to come here. He was an engineer. They sold up everything, made a little bit of profit from their house. Their three boys, their two Rottweilers, they came and moved into a little flat over here. They lived off the little bit of the profit that they made from their house. He did some invigilation on the side. They tried to get money. They ate through their savings. And eventually, with about 80 people in the church, they eventually had enough to start supporting themselves. And look where we are today. Because someone decided their stuff didn't own them. A family of three boys and two Rottweilers, they came over here in an Opal Cadet. Maybe you don't know what that is, but it's a very small car. You shouldn't be allowed under today's circumstances to fit your household. Three boys, two Rottweilers. Ian and Bernie, Ian's sitting here today. Bernie's written a book about their experiences of planting churches in Zimbabwe. When on two occasions, when everyone was leaving, they went in and planted churches. Arrested, forced to leave with nothing but the suitcases they had. And Zimbabwe's sitting in the legacy of their obedience today with churches they planted. Alan and Alian, Alan shares the testimony of how where Roland came to him. He was really, he was climbing in his teaching, H, head of department, all the rest of it. Roland asked him to take over the church. He went and resigned the next day. He said a result, he had to take his kid out of his private school because he wasn't teaching there anymore. He couldn't afford it. They had to move to a different house because they couldn't afford the house they were living in. They had to pay a price. Me and Melissa, we traded up. (laughs) We didn't know what we were going to earn here when we came. Melissa had to get rid of her business, pretty much break even, sold it to someone in Cape Town. I had really tried to be a property mogul. God had briefly saved me in 2008 from absolute ruin. We had properties to pay for. We came to Ellen, 1st of April. We're joining you. Pay us, don't pay us. We didn't, have a, we didn't have an employment contract or know what we were going to earn for years after that. Salary came into the bank and somehow things worked out. And God has been faithful every day since that day. Oh, we're a little bit short every now and again. God knows why we want a fourth kid. We can't afford three. <laughs> 
but we trust we're being faithful to his call on our lives. You know, we waited 12 years for him to say, start a family. We, we must wait another 12 for him to stay. Stop, we'll do that too. I'm only 44. I can sire another child still and not be called Opa. <laughs> okay. We need to change ownership. God needs to be able to own our stuff, not us. We need to change ownership. We need to sell all we have. And I don't really think, unless God's telling you there's something that's owning you right now, you need to sell it. But it's about saying, God, this is yours, it's not mine. And to continue to say that every day for the rest of your life. The second thing we need to do is we need to learn contentment. We need to learn to be happy. Philippians chapter 4 verse 10 to 13 and then 18 again says this. Paul writing. Paul writing to a church that has got absolutely nothing, but they've continually provided him in his time of need. They've been faithful to him again and again and again. In the time when they couldn't help, they helped. And he writes this letter of thanks to them. He says, I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. In other words, they had no means of blessing him, even though they were concerned, because they had nothing. He says, not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low. And he's speaking about finances here. He's thanking them for their contribution, and he's telling them, I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. And this verse, I can do all things through him who strengthens me, we've got to read it in context here. He's speaking about finances, whether they're there or not, because God's my provider, I can still do everything he calls me into. That's what the scripture means. He says, God is my provider. And based on his resource, not mine, whether I have plenty or little, I have all I need because I can do everything that he calls me into because he will supply my needs and he will supply what needs to happen. He says in verse 18, I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from uh, the gift you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. And he says this, and my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. We need to learn to be content. As I go back to Ian's story in, 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 in Zimbabwe, Bernie writes in her book that they would need to go and do visits, but there's no petrol in their car. What did you call that old Mercedes? What's your story? Betsy Lou. Betsy Lou. Old boat. You remember those old Mercedes? I'm sure they guzzled more diesel than they do today. I am guarantee you of that. And he said they'd need to go see someone. There was no fuel in the car. They'd pray over the car. They'd go see them. They'd come back. They didn't know how they got there and back. They shouldn't have got there. Bernie writes that she put lines because it was just so supernatural. Stripes on the shampoo bottles, on the soap bottles, because they used them and used them and they never went empty. I'm convinced that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me because it doesn't depend on my bank account. It depends on his calling. He is my supplier. Sure. Paul makes this incredible statement, in whatever situation, to be content. And we keep on setting these standards for ourselves and making these promises for ourselves. If I can just, just get over this thing, you know, generally speaking, middle class South Africa, middle class world, I don't know about you, I kind of think I'm middle class round about there, which I don't think is bad. And we kind of always just, just, just live just above our means. It's such a good deal on that house, man. How can I say no? 
If I don't buy this car now, it's like, it's just 30,000 rand out of my price bracket. Let's just do it. We just, 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 just live outside our means. And it's like, if I can just have a helper in the house for one extra day, if I can, at what standard will you be happy? He doesn't say, I'm convinced that if you just attain that next level, you'll be happy. He says, in whatever season, in whatever space, I will be content. That is the journey that we're on. Paul said, I have learned the process. I have learned. And he learned it through God's provision in those seasons of his life. He wasn't saved into that space. He learned it, journeying with God again and again and again, looking back. Friends, look back over your life in every time of need you've been through. Look at yourself today. Has God not brought you through? You might be in a dark time today, but this isn't the first dark time you've been in. Hasn't he been faithful every time? And we lose sight of it so quickly. In Hebrews 13 verse 5, he says, keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For he says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For I will never leave you nor forsake you. You see in this verse, God doesn't compare himself with money in a material way. He doesn't present himself in a way that if you follow me, I'm going to give you 10 times what you gave me. And frankly, any church that sells the idea that if you give me one rand, I will give you 10 rand is only perpetuating a broken system and feeding on your greed. Can you imagine going to your earthly dad and saying, I'm going to give you one rand, you've got to give me 10 rand back. It's greed, man. It's manipulation. Break away from that system. And here God puts these two together. He links freedom from the love of money and contentment together. In actual fact, he says you can't be content unless you're free from the love of money. Hmm. Jesus, 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 Jesus. I'm going to close briefly and then I'm gonna call Marius up to release a word over us and then we're gonna pray. The last idea I want to bring to us here is stories of God's financial breakthrough in people's lives. And you too can have this financial breakthrough. In Luke chapter 19 from verse 1 to 10, I'm not going to read the whole thing. But basically Zacchaeus, the chief tax collector, encounters Jesus. He doesn't encounter him in a finance talk. He doesn't encounter him in a finance seminar. And all of those are good. And I think it's definitely worth attending our finance talks here at the church. But he has an encounter with Jesus. And it says in verse 6, he says, after Jesus has invited him down from the tree and said, I want to come eat by you. It says, so he hurried and came down and he received him joyfully. He had an encounter with God. He received Jesus joyfully. And a couple verses later, Jesus doesn't challenge him on it. He doesn't ask him for it. He says, behold, Lord, half of my goods I will give to the poor. And if I've defrauded anyone of anything, I will restore it fourfold. Let me tell you what happened in that single, single encounter with Jesus. Everything he was looking for in finance he met in Jesus. Everything that his greed told him finance would provide, he saw in Jesus. And in an instant, the value of his possessions diminished and the value of Jesus increased. The Zacchaeus stock market crashed to nothing in a day and he realized that everything he had was worthless in the sight of Jesus. And Jesus was all he wanted. A single encounter with God changed his focus, changed the government over the systems of how he ran his household. Jesus became his Lord. Finance became his slave. And he was prepared to let it all go. We've gone full circle. We're coming back to the Israelites and God's provision in the desert. Marius, can you come release that prophetic word over us? Yeah, my bud. Morris is on eldership here with us. He heads our prophetic ministry, and he has a prophetic voice that I hugely honor. 
Thank you. Just to give context, um, the same people that Sean referred to, God numerous times led them into the desert and they came to a very challenging moment that even their basic need for water was not there. They, and then they start to cry out. They didn't behave well. But even in that, God was so generous. And in the, the well-known words that God says, speak to the rock. And I believe most of us might face rocks at some point. Even the series talks about mental rocks, relational rocks. But I would like to pray into that because I believe God says, speak to the rock. And he's the rock. He can be a rock that we can stand on, faithful, true for you and me. And as we speak to him, he can be living waters breaking over your life, breaking over your situation, because that is what he is. Can we pray together? Lord, this morning you invite us. You have led us all in a journey. And like your people of old, Lord, we can all say, Lord, we see rocks before us, things that challenge us, things that cause us to cry out, God, where are you? Are you still concerned for me? Do you know my name? But God, thank you that you come to each one of us. And even in this morning, I trust by faith, you will release over their own hearts that they can, see, can say, Lord, thank you for this rock, that I can speak to it, that I can say, Lord, in your name, break open this rock. My waters gush out of it. My life come through that, Lord. I pray, Lord, I speak over the rocks that people face in your name. But, Lord, maybe there's rocks of unbelief. Maybe there's rocks of a poverty mentality, of confusion, or distrust. I pray that that rock will break open and there will come such a confidence, such a trust, such a faith, such a freshness of faith, of a confidence and believing in who you are. That with confidence that they can say, God, I'm facing this thing, but I know that you for me. And because you are for me, I can scale this wall. I can storm a troop. I can walk through this giant. Lord, I trust that you will come by your spirit this morning and impart fresh faith, fresh vision, fresh understanding, fresh confidence in the hearts of your people. And Lord, where we want to speak to these rocks, where there's financial challenges, relational challenges, maybe mental or emotional challenges, that is hard. I want to say in Jesus' name, crack open those rocks. Break open those things in Jesus' name. May life flow to them, Lord. Touch hearts. Touch minds. Touch relationships. Touch those things that you want to release over your people this morning in Jesus' name. Because as we've heard, you're a good, good father. And you care for us. Thank you that we can cast our burdens upon you because you care for us. Thank you for your care for your people this morning. Thank you, Lord, for breaking open things. We pray release in the name of Jesus. Release in the name of Jesus. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord.